Welcome to Network Capital, Abhay. Uh, through this series of podcast discussions and masterclasses, we try and demystify different career principles and mental models. You are somebody who's had a distinguished career in two different tracks, and you are essentially leading a multi-dimensional career. Tell us a bit about who you are and what do you do today? Well, uh, I am a poet diplomat, you know, a tradition which uh, goes back to many centuries. And uh, I, first of all, I mean, I started writing poetry after becoming a diplomat. That's another interesting, you know, twist in my tale that uh, um, I joined foreign service in 2003 and then uh, I went to Moscow in 2005 as uh, to study um, Russian language and literature at Moscow State University. And uh, um, during that time, I started writing poetry. Uh, but uh, my first book was a memoir, actually. It's called River Valley to Silicon Valley, uh, which told the story of my three generations of my family, uh, as well as my own story. Um, and uh, it was published in 2007. So um, afterwards, uh, I have only written poems. Uh, uh, I have also written another memoir, which is called um, Colors of Soul, which is about the art life in St. Petersburg. I'm also an artist. I have done exhibitions of my paintings in uh, Paris and uh, New Delhi and Brasilia so far. And uh, so, I mean, basically I, uh, I, I'm, I'm a lover of life actually, you know, I try to use every moment I have and uh, I do things which I really like doing. So it's sort of, uh, you know, enjoying myself, uh, doing things uh, which really interests me. So, um, well, I mean, poetry, diplomacy, painting, you know, and uh, and so on. So it's it's basically, I mean, love for life, you know, uh, what you call in French, uh, joie de vivre. Absolutely. Uh, so before we discover joie de vivre, love for life, tell us a bit about your background. Like, uh, what was childhood like and... How did the thought of entering civil service first enter your mind? Well, I grew up, uh, I was born in uh, a very small village in Nalanda, district of Bihar. Uh, name of the village is Chabilapur. And uh, my father was a teacher. He was a teacher in the primary school in the village. And uh, my mother, who is still alive, uh, is uh, is a housewife, and uh, so I studied uh, mostly uh, till the middle school uh, in the in the nearby village, you know. And then uh, there is a town, famous town called Rajgir. I did my high school from there. Then I moved to Patna to do intermediate, and I studied at um, BN College. And then from there, uh, I moved to Delhi University and study, studied uh, uh, geography at Kirorimal College uh, before moving to JNU, actually, where I studied uh, uh, geography. I did master's from there in 2002. And then uh, when I was in first year of MPhil, uh, I uh, wrote this exam and... Uh, was selected for the foreign service. Uh, so my childhood was, you know, it was, um, uh, I, I very fondly remember uh, playing uh, with, uh, you know, other children and uh, listening to stories uh, from my grandma. And uh, uh, I mean, my grandma, when I was uh, small, I mean, uh, my grandma, grandma was very, um, you know, she was already very old. And, uh, uh, 
and she used to tell me stories at night and we used to sleep in the courtyard uh, looking at the stars and the moon so uh, and then listening to bird song so i mean that memory you know and my village was by a river uh, my ancestral village where grandma used to live so um, i used to visit her time to time and uh, um, you know we had an orchard of guavas so and so we used to pick those guavas so i mean it's uh, it was the dream childhood you know i mean i would not i haven't uh, um, i haven't come across something like that uh, again and uh, i think it's uh, um, you know the quest for returning to that uh, kind of dream uh, place you know that that keeps uh, uh, that 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 keeps me you know to to i mean motivated to imagine and to write poetry yeah it's all coming together <laughs> it, uh, tell us about um, you know the first book you wrote um and what was the process of putting it together because you know of course you were busy and you were traveling from country to country uh where did you find time to write what was the discipline involved well uh when i was in moscow i was uh, mm, uh, i had plenty of time actually because i was learning all i had to do was to learn russian language at the moscow state university and then i had lots of free time so i didn't have to go and work uh, at the embassy so um, for first year i mean at least for a year i had uh, plenty of time and uh, um, after the university classes i used to come and write down uh, i think it took me 6 months um, to write 200 pages and uh, so um, uh, you know i was lucky actually that you know i i was not asked to regularly work during that time so uh, and that i mean that that put me on the path of writing interesting and how did uh, uh, how did you inculcate how do you transition from that to poetry well i mean poetry uh, poetry started happening naturally to me uh, i think you know there the first thing was that you know i was so fascinated by the beauty of moscow you know i mean from all angles uh, a beautiful city a beautiful metro beautiful people so i mean uh, uh, and uh, uh, i had plenty of time so i think uh, um, you know uh, when i was growing up in bihar uh, my father had a um, at 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 home we used to have lots of books and one of the books uh, we had at home was rashmi rathi by ramdhari singh dinkar and uh, that book uh, i have been uh, you know uh, those days when I, when i was in class 4 or 5 uh, uh, i used to read that book and i was fascinated by the sound of uh, uh, the third canto of rashmi rathi it was i mean that those things you know those lines they always stayed with me and when i was in moscow Uh, uh, poetry i mean it it started coming to me i mean it was it was not a conscious choice that you know i want to write a poem i mean uh, i never actually you know i also wrote a poem called i don't want to be a poet you know so it's a, i mean and i didn't know anything about actually literature or indian poetry at that time and particularly indian english poetry so uh, when i was writing i was not writing with this uh, uh with this ambition which some people have that you know they want to have a professional career as a writer no it was not like that you know i mean i was so fascinated with moscow's beauty that i used to paint and i used to write poems you know mm, so it was a uh, it happened naturally to me i mean poetry yeah. uh, poetry found poetry found me sort of <laughs> poetry and tell us a bit <laughs> it's actually a wonderful way to look at uh, life poetry art uh, what specifically about uh, moscow made you write because it's a very particular kind of a city right like there's the pushkin cafe the usual suspects but there are also lots of hidden treasures and uh, right. as a diplomat perhaps you get to explore that 
and there's also a lot of literary uh, heritage in that particular city. So um, was there a particular process after Poetry Found You where you translated the beauty into words? Um, if yes, what advice do you have for aspiring poets and writers? I think uh, it was, uh, you know, I mean, uh, it, it was the, I mean, it was, I think, the change, you know, I mean, uh, because I had, uh, I had grown up in mostly in Bihar and then in Delhi for, you know, eight years. Uh, and uh, Moscow was a huge change. It was something which was grand. It was magnificent. And then the people were extremely gorgeous, you know? So, I mean, it, it, I mean, everything was so grand there. Uh, I mean, if you go to Moscow, I don't know if you have visited it. Everything is very, very I have, grand. and I share your love for it. Yes, the, the yeah, stations, well, <laughs> the cafes, everything. Metro yeah. stations, and then, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, and people actually, you know, so I learned Russian and then, I mean, this this whole thing, it was very intoxicating, you know, and uh, uh, the whole, uh, this whole, you know, then the galleries, the art galleries, then the art life there, you know, so everything was fascinating. And then, uh, I mean, uh, I was interacting with young Russians, you know, and uh, uh, it was uh, it was very very rewarding and very I mean something something which I could only express through poems and uh, I think that that, that was the reason. Right. Um, if you uh, you spoke about earlier about the tradition of diplomats also being poets. There's also. Right. Uh, Octavio Paz, uh, you know, in one of the articles, you've been called the Octavio, Octavio Paz of India, which I think was uh, quite a title. But uh, tell us more about uh, the history, the legacy, and how did you feel when you first read this? Because I sent you the article, right? Which, uh, which I yeah, read I mean, I yeah, so Oscar. yeah, I, I, yeah, I thought that, you know, I mean, it was, uh, that was a surprise, actually. Uh, you know, and uh, thanks to you, I got to read that article. Otherwise, I would have not found that. So uh, that's uh, you know, I mean, it, there are it's a it's a long tradition. I mean, Octavio Paz is one of them, but also Pablo Neruda and uh, uh, George Seferis, Gabriela Mistral. Um, um, there are there are a number of uh, poet diplomats who have excelled both in the art of poetry and diplomacy. And uh, uh, St. John Perse, for example, from France, he was also the secretary general at Quad Orsay, at the foreign office you know, of, uh, of France. And, uh, and he, he, all of these are also Nobel laureates in, uh, in literature, actually. So, uh, but but the tradition goes uh, goes uh, uh, I mean much much back in history actually, and uh, uh, and there are a number of uh, uh, you know writers, famous writers who are who were actually you know who were diplomats or who were ambassadors. So I think you know this this tradition has. I mean, I, then, you know, it made me curious that what is it between poetry and diplomacy, you know, which uh, uh, kind of, uh, why do some some poets, uh, poet diplomats excel in both these? So then I was looking at, I was thinking, you know, I was pondering over it. And then, you know, I came up with uh, certain, you know, commonalities between poetry and diplomacy. And uh, one of these, uh, I mean, uh, there are a number of them. The first one is, it's like A, B, C, D, you know? So first one is ambiguity. Uh, so uh, you, you tell it what Emily Dickinson says, you tell it, but you tell it slant. So that's how it is. I mean, both poetry and diplomacy uh, use indirect uh, way to communicate. Uh, through, you know, keep a little bit of uh, slantness, uh, I mean, indirectness. Uh, then right. uh, second is brevity of expressions. 
you know, you say more in less words in both poetry and diplomacy. Uh, I mean, um, poetry is essential language. So you only uh, keep the words which, which are essential and rest goes, uh, unlike a novel where you can go on um, and so forth. Then the third, you know, I mean, uh, is uh, this, uh, um, uh, um, this art of, uh, you know, both poetry and diplomacy uh, deal with, I mean, as a poet and a diplomat, you deal with words every day. Um, as a diplomat to you, I mean, you are very careful, uh, you know, what you say and uh, what you not say, you know, I mean, that's even more important, actually. So in poetry too, I mean, you have to be even one wrong word and then the whole poem is gone, you know? So uh, it's a very mm, delicate art. So this uh, delicateness, you know, I mean, mm, uh, one thing both these arts teach you, both poetry and diplomacy is to be careful with your words. I mean, to choose your words very carefully. So mm, then, I mean, both as a poet and diplomat, you are, sense, I mean, you deal with, you are a sensitive human being. I mean, you, you, you I mean, you have this sense of uh, uh, empathy and sensitivity uh, because without that, you won't be, make a good poet or a good diplomat uh, because as a diplomat, you are a bridge. You are not only taking care. I mean, some people say that, you know, it is only your own national interests, but then these are not, these are enlightened national interests in the sense that, you know, you cannot uh, gain something uh, until you give something. So you have to be sensitive to uh, the needs of uh, the two sides. So then only you can make uh, negotiations and can make things happen. Uh, when two sides see, you know, the benefit in, in dealing with you. So, uh, so as, I mean, as both poets and diplomats, I mean, as a poet, if you're not sensitive, you won't be able to get into the skin of somebody else uh, or, you know, not become the voice of the, you won't be able to become the voice of the voiceless. So um, uh, uh, I think this is an important quality, which, you know, so that's why I thought that, you know, there are a number of things which connect both poetry and diplomacy. Uh, thank you so much for giving us two frameworks. One is A, B, C, D and the other one of uh, adding value to others. You can't be takers all the time. You need to give and contribute to others. Otherwise, you'll always be perceived as predatory in a negotiation, which you can't be in business or uh, in public yeah. life or in country to country uh, dialogues. Yeah. So thanks so much for laying it out clearly. So uh, you've published a wide range of uh, poems and collections. Um, let's actually start with uh, something that we find really interesting, which is uh, Moon, uh, sorry, the Mars Anthem. So Network Capital is a partner of uh, Government of India's Utter Innovation Mission, as part of which we help mentor uh, or provide support mentoring 1.6 million kids today. And the thesis is that a lot of erstwhile Indian education is focused on the what, not the how. And in the, you know, we need to enable kids to dream so that they can achieve moon shots or Mars shots. So talk to us about your Mars anthem and moon anthem. Uh, how did you write it? What is it? What's your hope for the children or the young people of India when you wrote this? Right. So I started with the Earth Anthem, you know, which I wrote in 2008. Uh, yes. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, it, it was put to music in 2013. And now it's been, it's gone global. I mean, it's been translated into over 50 languages. It was played at the United Nations. And then uh, it's been, uh, also it is used every year by thousands of schools uh, and children to celebrate uh, Earth Day or the World Environment Day. So this is something, you know, I mean, uh, I the, the difference between a world anthem, you know, and an earth anthem is that in earth anthem, uh, we talk about each and every species who share this planet with us, not only human beings. And uh, uh, the, I mean, and uh, it's, I mean, uh, we have a cosmic perspective as if I'm looking at the earth from outside. So from the moon maybe. 
So, uh, so it's uh, the words of the Earth Anthem, you know, which is most important today for children, uh, because we must understand that, you know, there are two organic realities in this world, the individual and the planet, and the rest of, rest in the between is all man-made, you know. So, um, so this, we must understand this truth, and uh, this truth will free us, and how? So see the words of the Earth Anthem, it, it goes like this, our cosmic oasis, cosmic blue pearl, the most beautiful planet in the universe, all the oceans and all the continents, um, united we stand as flora and fauna, united we stand as species of one Earth, diverse cultures, beliefs, and ways. We are humans. Earth is our home. All the people and all the nations, one for all and all for one. United we unfurl the blue marble flag. So this is an anthem for unity, not only for the unity of mankind, Amazing but also the unity, unity of all species on our planet. Uh, today I was thinking that can be, you know, a million species today face extinction. And uh, uh, would it be not possible for a million rich people to adopt each species, you know, each species. So there are million people for million species, you know, and we adopt them like uh, to protect like one species, you know, we take care of one species. And I'm sure that there would be a billion people for to save these million species and save biodiversity on our planet. I think that's the real capital we have. Uh, without, once we lose them, we lose them forever. And uh, today, I mean, you have seen the reports. You know, the Das Gupta report has come, which which uh, says, I mean, which uh, advocates uh, bringing together, fusing together economics and ecology. Because, because, I mean, without uh, ecology, we have no economics and no capital. And it's so important to introduce this thinking early on, you know, in schools, in colleges, so that people, when they grow up, uh, right. they are uh, they can put nationalism and internationalism in the proper perspective. So I think that's why perhaps this poem has resonated so strongly um, among uh, the readers, students, and uh, other folks. So congratulations for that and for, uh, you know, it's widespread appreciation. Um, how you. much time did it take you to put this together? And do, are you somebody who edits a lot or what's your, uh, you know, writing process like? Yeah, so no, I mean, it, it, I wrote it as a poem in 2008 and then slowly when it was put to music, it was sort of, uh, you know, some words were removed, some words were kind of, you know, put to uh, to scale so that there's a music. So it became shorter. What I read you is the anthem, but there was a larger poem which uh, which was originally, you know, there. So I mean, uh, editing is a continuous process. You know, and uh, even after you publish your poems, you I mean, after two years or three years, you revisit them and you see that oh, this is this is the word which should have been, you know, removed or deleted or added. So, I mean, uh, it's, it's kind of unending process and uh, there's never a, a, never a moment when you feel that, you know, it's perfect, you know, there's something, this could have been like this, you know, there's an, always an option uh, to change things. Mm. Uh, but I, I, you know, I mean, just to uh, continue with your question on the Mars and the moon anthem and the anthems of all the planets. I mean, on on 21st of December this last year, uh, when the conjunction happened between the Jupiter and Saturn, uh, that day, mm, you know, Scroll had published all these anthems, the 10 anthems in, uh, you know, on the planets in our solar system and plus the moon and sun. So um, eight planets plus two. So so I mean this is to this was the uh, I mean I wrote these anthems you know for the solar system because you know we are too self obsessed we do not realize that you know we are a grain of sand 
uh, in the larger scheme of things, you know, we don't matter actually. And, uh, and we must have, we must uh, broaden our horizons, you know, we must broaden our perspective. So everything is relative in this life. And uh, once you start looking at Earth from the, uh, from, from Neptune, for example, or from, uh, from Alpha Centauri, um, uh, the whole perspective changes. So, uh, so that's, that's the need of the hour. We must look at Earth uh, from outside. Uh, and uh, that's why these anthems, you know, uh, to, to look at Mars, to, to, to look at uh, Jupiter and to, to so, so broaden our consciousness from uh, being a, you know, um, being a nationalist or I mean, being from certain village or from a, you know, from certain city to being, you know, belonging to the whole solar system and looking at the beauty of these planets and uh, wanting to go there someday, you know, maybe for example, Mars. Uh, which is about six months away from us. So uh, at at present, I mean, at present technology we have. So uh, I think that it's important to broaden this perspective, you know. Uh, if, um, everything changes the way you look at things. Uh, in five billion years of time, even the sun is gone, you know. So, yeah. so nothing is here. So, I mean, so we have to look that way, you know, I mean, we, we must broaden our consciousness. And I think, you know, most of our problems are because the way we think, you know, the way we look at the things. So once we change the perspective, you know, most of the problems disappear. Uh, so it's important. I thought that, you know, one of the lines, you know, if you look at the solar system or look at the nearby stars, you know, uh, there's a word, there's a line in this, uh, the, the, the way the earth anthem begins is our cosmic oasis. So, so you look at Mars or look at Venus, for example, you know, they are deserts. So they are, I mean, uh, compared to what we have on earth. So, so it's like an oasis in a desert, in a cosmic desert. Uh, and it's also like the true paradise, you know, when people say that, you know, they want to go to heaven, they want to go to, you know, the Garden of Eden. You, you are in the Garden of Eden, you know, uh, you are in the paradise. Look at, look around you. What, what is there on Jupiter? What is there on Saturn? You know, that's why these anthems become important, you know, and, uh, uh, so, so the purpose is to, of all these, is to 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 what to preserve and protect what we have, you know, to preserve and protect the paradise we already have, and we think that, you know, I mean, most of the most of the religions think that, you know, they will uh, once they die, they will go to the true heaven. But right now, the true heaven is in front of you. It's it's right here. It's the bird song. It's the uh, it's the colors of the zebra, it's the Be Royal Bengal tiger. It is, uh, mm, you know, the hummingbirds of Colombia, you know. This is your paradise. And please try to understand it before it is too late and before a million species are gone. Absolutely. In your opinion, is there, a, is, you've traveled to so many countries, you've been an ambassador in a wide range of countries. Um, are you seeing efforts or... Uh, where the market capitalism etc is being you know uh, taken forward in line with ecological considerations or uh, you know just conservation of any kind because it seems that uh, in many parts of the world there is lip service being paid to you know environmental concerns but in practice it's not really in that direction united states for example until recently um, had quite an interesting stance on climate altogether. So how do we create uh, a platform where we enable young people to really take this seriously and uh, not perhaps be uh, misled by half-truths and semi-baked uh, facts? Any uh, thoughts on that? Well, see, um, uh, lots of good work is happening all across the world, you know. 
for example, uh, India itself has taken a lead in solar energy. Uh, so many countries are uh, increasing the areas under forest cover. So there are good examples where which which should inspire the younger generation. And uh, as I said that, you know, I believe in Mahatma Gandhi's words that, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. And uh, this is the opportunity to be that change for the younger generation. And uh, they must uh, uh, look at the whole planet as their home, you know, taking again the words from the earth anthem, uh, we are humans, earth is our home, you know. And uh, until we until we realize that that truth that the whole planet is one and uh, and they must they must take care of it it means that you know you cannot dump things in this ocean you know it's going to come back to you so it all it's like as we say charity begins at home it begins with us so uh, so so the things i say is that you know the steps one has to take is to you know uh, it starts right from home, one's home. So see, to see that, you know, the we do not use polythene. We, do, we recycle our waste, you know, or do composting. Use solar energy uh, as much as possible, wherever it is possible, uh, to, to, uh, to have solar panels to use the, you know, to, to meet your energy needs. And it's possible the solar energy has become much cheaper much more economical you know for example uh, our i mean last year in october uh, we became the first uh, embassy in uh, antananarivo in madagascar to go solar and uh, use i mean uh, to meet our energy from from solar energy all our energy needs so uh, that's that's how we have to do things you know i mean uh, transport for example um, we can use more and more uh, I mean, electrical vehicles, or we can uh, we can try to reduce the number of uh, trips we take every day. We can try to you know eat let eat, eat less meat. Uh, we can try to I mean, I was watching this movie. I don't know if you have seen it. It's called Earthlings, and what goes behind this uh, you know production? It's of, excellent. Uh, uh, yeah, meat and production of. Uh, uh, so, so I mean, I think, uh, you know, the change will happen at the individual level. I also feel that, you know, the companies, the big companies, you know, which produce uh, plastic uh, bottles, you know, and sell their products through plastic bottles should also have the responsibility to uh, take those plastic bottles back and recycle them. It should not be left to people and to the, uh, to the local uh, municipalities to deal with that problem. I think we need a, I mean, wherever in restaurants, wherever I go and eat, I request them to use, uh, not to use the plastic uh, straws. And, you know, many of them, they have changed. So uh, advocacy really helps. Self-change really helps. It, it, it's, it's up to us, you know, I mean, uh, so the younger generation, particularly, they must uh, come forward to uh, to be the change you know they would like to see in the world truly very powerful words uh, here uh, you've been uh, you've recently come out with yet another book uh, which uh, i saw fortunately at a wonderful uh, bookstore in delhi right next to i mean our, my book and your book were kept right next to each other and i thought what a wonderful oh, really? time it is it's uh, great that we're actually going to be chatting soon but yes, uh, what I noticed was that when I bought the book and read it, is that uh, this seems like somebody who's been, who's writing quite regularly even today. So talk to us about your new collection. What was the inspiration, and how do you, uh, despite your uh, uh, fairly busy life, how do you manage to eke time out for uh, for it? It's amazing to see this. Uh, <laughs> I, I, well, so this is a this is a labor of love, and uh, uh, I was uh, before this uh, 
uh, I have edited another book called the, um, the Bloomsbury Anthology of Great Indian Poems. And, uh, um, and that, you know, that happened uh, um, two years ago. Uh, first it began as 100 Great Indian Poems and then 100 more Great Indian Poems. And then the two were combined to form this book called the Bloomsbury Anthology of Great Indian Poems. And uh, this, uh, uh, during, when I was editing this book, I realized that many of these great Indian poems were actually love poems. And uh, why should I not do an anthology of uh, uh, great Indian love poems? And uh, um, then I started looking for love poems from various Indian languages. Because, you know, I mean, uh, the two things, you know, first is that I wanted to bring back the focus uh, on poems rather than poets. So uh, that was one of my goals of editing 100 Great Indian Poems, because earlier anthologies were mostly focused on poets. Uh, and the second that, you know, I was not quite happy with Indian English poetry scene. Uh, and I wanted to bring a, you know, the flavor, the rich flavor from all Indian languages. Uh, from so, so I collected poems from 28 Indian languages and put them together in 100 great Indian poems. And uh, uh, this is a book which has been, uh, which has really traveled the world. It has been translated and published into several languages. Uh, Portuguese, for example, by into Portuguese by the University of Sao Paulo in, uh, and then in Spanish, uh, University of New Mexico, and then in uh, Italian uh, by a publisher in Rome, and uh, uh, in Malagasy language. And then it's being translated into, it's already been translated, but it's awaiting publication in Irish, Nepali, Russian, German, French, uh, and so on. So, uh, so this is like taking Indian poetry to the world. So that was the, that when I did that, you know, uh, I felt that I must do a book on love poems. And, uh, uh, and this is how uh, this book, this book was born. Uh, and uh, now, um, for example, Mm, you know, it has... Can you read out um, one of your favorite poems? Yes. For example, this is a poem by, mm, you know, mm, uh, let me read you a poem by mm, Dharmakirti. Uh, Dharmakirti was, as you know, chancellor at... Uh, Mm, the Nalanda University. Every month the moon attempts to capture the beauty of your face and having miserably failed, erases the work to start afresh. This is a short and pretty poem. And then... It's uh, beautiful. Uh, then there is this uh, uh, poem by Sachal Sarmast, uh, and it is called, You are beloved, God too. You are one with me, apart to how to describe you. You are beloved, God too, how to describe you. If not right here, then nowhere else. Who is it love singing here sweetly in the garb of a dancing girl? Such a is his name. If not right here, then nowhere else. Amazing. And I see that uh, in, uh, in many of your works, for example, Emily Dickinson is also a, a huge influence. So tell us about uh, you know uh, the influence she's had on you and some of the other poets, um, and you still haven't uh, told us about how you managed to take time out in a busy day to write. 
So tell us all about it. <laughs> okay, no, I mean, uh, see, I haven't read much of Emily Dickinson actually. You know, that's I just use her quote actually, tell it, tell it slant. But you know, my major, I mean, major influence on me are, uh, I think, uh, you know, Kabir and Ramdari Singh Dinkar and uh, and uh, Walt Whitman and uh, Mislava Zimborska uh, and. Uh, uh, Pablo Neruda and and so on, you know, I mean Octavio Paz, for example. So uh, so these are well, uh, Octavio Paz, you've been uh, called that as well. But Walt Whitman is actually a big network capital favorite as well, especially his multitudes. Uh, I was wondering why right. and how um, you came to admire him and some of the other poets you mentioned. Talk to us about Dinka. Talk to us about Whitman and and other influences. So Walt Whitman is uh, uh, someone whom I truly admire. I read him in when I was studying in JNU, uh, his Leaves of Grass. And uh, uh, I remember this uh, poem called Stranger, uh, which is stranger if you uh, see, if you, if you see me, uh, if you pass by and see me, uh, why, why should you not smile at me? and why I should not smile at you. And uh, uh, this has always stayed with me, you know, this poem. And uh, mm, I mean, I find nothing much more, nothing more, re more rewarding than, you know, sharing a smile with a stranger, you know? I think that's, that's I, that I find, you know, the most beautiful thing uh, in this life, you know? And uh, this has, uh, uh, I mean, you're, you're walking, in street and you come across a stranger you know and you just smile at each other and and that's all you know nothing else so uh so that's something which is uh, uh, i mean which that's the image i carry of walt whitman you know and i see him smiling sometime and uh, uh and i was talking about uh, other poets for example uh, t.s Eliot uh, or Vislava. Uh, Simborska. So, uh, Vislava Simborska, I mean, she has a book, collection of poems called Map. And uh, uh, that's uh, that's a book, uh, uh, you know, I recommend for everyone. Uh, because each of her poems is a revelation, you know, uh, out of, I mean, there are extraordinary uh, insights into ordinary things in life. And uh, Eliot, for example, there's no comparison of uh, Eliot uh, uh, in style. You know, I have not come across any poet who has who has a style like T.S. Eliot has, and uh, uh, he's uh, someone. You know, I have rewritten his uh, poems. For example, I wrote a poem called "Proof Rock at the Carnival in Rio." which was a rewriting of... You should read it his, out uh, to us if you have it uh, handy. Uh, so uh, I'll have to find it, Proof Rock at the Carnival in Rio. It's from my book, uh, The Alphabets of Latin America. Uh, let me see if I have the book right, uh, book here around. Mm. So uh, this is... Yeah. Mm. So proof rock at the, I mean, it's a long poem, you know, <laughs> which will take time, you know. So, uh, but it's, it's a kind of, you know, rewriting of, let me see if I can find it. Uh, uh, it's a rewriting of his poem uh, called The Love Song of uh, J. Alfred Proof Rock. And uh, uh, it's a, mm, it's, it, it's a poem which is uh, you know, which is one of my favorite poems, uh, as uh, as I, you know, when I was in Brazil, uh, I was uh, uh, I I went to saw the carnival. I don't know if you have been to Rio, uh, but uh, uh, I went to see this carnival, and then these words automatically started, uh, you know, coming to my mind. And uh, each word kind of uh, uh, fit into you know this poem, which was Eliot's poem, which which I wrote, rewrote. Okay, so here it is. Let's go then to Rio, 
to the carnival when drums are beating like heartbeats of lovers meeting after a long interval and samba dancers are out in the streets let's go and catch a flight to rio flights full of revelers that take off at night oh do not say no let's go in the samba drome dancers come and go showing off their torso the colorful suits roll on and on the colorful marchers sing passionate songs mesmerized revelers bite their tongues and shout in drunken madness swaying back and forth like sea waves under the full moon february night we have february and full moon wow uh, there will be time for the samba dancers to move their hips back and forth there will be time there will be time to dance in full glory under the moon there will be time to steal hearts moving hands and feet time for this time for that and time yet for a hundred others before the long night is finally over in the samba drum dancers come and go showing off their torso and indeed there will come a moment to ponder should i descend the stairs and join the samba dancers with other drunken revelers they will say what is sport i wear a khaki colored linen coat over a white shirt linen trousers the color of dirt they will say how does he dress so smart should i descend the stairs and join the carnival eternity hides in a moment i wait for that moment's arrival for i have known that such a moment exists have known that such a moment comes once in ages and i have waited for it so long and i know it is coming it will come with the music light and colors of the carnival so should i not wait a little more and i have seen the world london paris amsterdam new york shanghai durban and many other wonders so where should i end my journey of years and years so how should i end and i have known other pleasures known them all pleasures that belong to grown up men and women but rio carnival is transcendental beyond all is it the beating of drums or the bare samba dancers that make me scream and then should i assume this is it shall i say i have seen all the samba schools and watched all the samba queens in the samba drums on the top of exotic floats i should have thought, brought a pair of the best binoculars to look at these unforgettable splendid sights and the night is fully awake filled with joyous screams people swaying twirling in kamarochi with pouring music songs beside you and me would i after copious drinks and sumptuous dinner have the strength to leap into the crowd do i have reveled and feasted reveled and flirted do i have seen samba dancers wearing nothing but paint riding the floats performing gymnastic feats i am no saint and here is nothing to regret i have seen this moment of my life etching itself into eternity and i have seen a drop of water contain an ocean and i can say it with certainty and has it been worth it after all after the long wait crowds and a night of jostling among the common men and women in samba drum has it been worthwhile to have stood the whole night on my feet to have left behind my only child with someone i have hardly known to stay i am krishna from the dwapar age i have come to see the ras leela in rio if one joining the carnival should say the ras leela is the carnival of the modern age and has it been worth it after all 
Has it been worth it after all? After the sea wind that strikes the window panes, after the walk over white sands of Copacabana and Ipanema and so much more. And it, it is possible to say this is it. This is it what I meant. It has been worth it after all. To walk over the white sand, to touch sea waves with one's feet. This is it. This is all. No, I'm not Ram or Buddha, nor was meant to be. I'm a flirtatious lord, one that will see a samba queen dance in her full spree, prod her to do even better, get electric, regal, stately, full of thunderous energy, at times slow and with a pause, but without a dull moment at all. I grow fonder and fonder of the samba dance. I shall remain forever here in Rio given a chance. Shall I grow my hair and become a karaoke cutie? Shall I go straight to the beach or return to duty? I have heard Copacabana is full of beauties. I do not think they will look at me. I have seen them lying on the sand, wearing nothing but a book in their hand, lying on the beach between sea and land. We have reveled long in Rio, seen samba girls in all shades of the rainbow. Shall we go then? Shall we return home? It was a long poem, so excuse me. It was absolutely stunning. I mean, I was taking, uh, you know, closing my eyes and listening to it. Uh, there's clearly, you know, a magic in your words and it, uh, I love the fact that your poetry seems very experiential. And I think the fact that you've traveled a lot, been to a lot of places from Madagascar to Munger, I think it really helps you sort of draw out the entire uh, landscape. I just want to um, get some Thank advice you. From, you, from you. <laughs> get some advice uh, from you uh, for all our listeners. Um, can you break down your advice into three parts? One is advice for future diplomats. Second, advice for future poets. And third, advice for aspiring you know, poets and diplomats. So if you could give us um, some thoughts on that, that'll be very helpful. I think, you know, for all the three, I have one advice, you know, and that is to keep uh, our planet at the center of your thoughts, your work, and your dreams, because this is all we have. Uh, I think uh, everything we do, if we have a planetary per perspective, a planetary consciousness, either in poetry or in diplomacy or in business, uh, I think you know we are going in the right direction. If our work uh, moves away from this then our direction needs course correction. So um, uh, one of the, also one of the poems, you know, I would recommend uh, everyone, you know, all uh, the aspiring poet or aspiring diplomat or aspiring uh, entrepreneur is uh, Ithaka by uh, C.P. Kabafi. Uh, it's, uh, Ithaka is one of my all time favorite poems. And I don't know if, uh, um, if any one of you have read it, but uh, I have in Ithaca only. Yeah, so it's a it, it's a something which I would recommend everyone to read. Uh, it's a it's a poem which is must read, you know. And I always uh, uh, post this poem to the you know the new batches of foreign service officers, and uh, uh, I tell them that just replace Ithaca by foreign service <laughs> so i would say that you know the same to everyone just re replace ithaka by by whatever uh, you know you belong to and this poem is that you know as you set out for ithaka or you can say that set out for foreign service or for business or for uh, po for poetry hope your road is long one full of adventure full of discovery Lastrigonians, Cyclops, Angry Poisedon. We all come across them, don't we? Right, absolutely. <laughs> don't be afraid of them. 
you will never find things like that on your way. As long as you keep your thoughts raised high, as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body, Lastrigonians, Cyclops, wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul, unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Hope your road is a long one. May there be many summer mornings when with what pleasure, what joy you enter harbors you are seeing for the first time. As I was telling you about Moscow, you know. Harbors you are seeing for the first time. May you stop at Phoenician trading stations to buy fine things. Mother of pearl and coral, amber and ebony, sensual perfume of every kind or many sensual perfumes as you can. And may you visit many Egyptian cities to learn and go on learning from their scholars. Keep Ithaka always in your mind. Arriving here is what you are destined for, but don't hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years. So you are old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you have gained on the way not expecting Ithaka to make you rich. Ithaka gave you the marvelous journey. Without her, you would have set out. Without her, you would not have set out. She has nothing left to give you now. And if you find her poor, Ithaka won't have fooled you. Wise as you will have become so full of experience you will have understood by then what these Ithakas mean. I think that's my advice to all of, all of, you know, all, all of them. You know, uh, a poet and diplomat ending a, a podcast in a poetic way, we could not have asked for more. Thanks so much for launching uh, your book with us, for your thoughts, for your advice, for your reflections. And... Uh, Valentine's Day is coming and I... <laughs> Valentine's Day is coming and Network Capital is there in 112 countries now. So we can I make see. it the official Valentine's Day anthem. You know, what better than poetry? Wonderful. Thank we you for this opportunity. You again, sir, this was uh, the first episode. We got to do so much more. The world of poetry is infinite. And, uh, you know, no one better than you to talk to us about the duality of uh, diplomacy and poetry. Thanks so much for your time. Talk to you very soon. Bye. Thank you so much for this. Namaste. Bye. Bye.